not my time to keep my dairy on the chair. I've heard that uh, Congress wants to uh, simplify the tax form for uh, this year. Four lines only. First line, what was your income last year? Second line, what were your expenses? Third line, how much do you have left? Fourth line, send it in. <laughs> Likewise, God was taking away from the Israelites all that they had left because they weren't faithfully serving him. Uh, turn with me to Haggai chapter 1, please. Haggai chapter 1. And as you're turning to Haggai chapter 1, I need to set the stage for you chronologically. We have to go back to a key date that I'm sure many of you know. It's 586 B.C. In 586 B.C., that was the time when the southern kingdom of Judah got annihilated, basically, by the Babylonians, and the temple was destroyed. The place of worship was raised to the ground. It was a significant time. You move forward several decades, and we have Cyrus the Great. He was a Persian king. And Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon, and then a year later, he decreed that the Jews could go back to Israel. 50,000 Jews came back, which really wasn't a lot, during the first wave. Now, in 536 B.C., the foundation of the temple was laid. Think about it. It was a long time ago, 586, when it was destroyed. The foundation is laid. But then there's opposition to rebuild the rest of the temple that came from the Samaritans. So only the foundation got laid, and then it sat dormant for 16 years. Think about that, everybody. Now, here's some questions for you to consider before I read Haggai chapter 1. What consequences do you experience when God's work is ignored? In other words, when you're not doing what God has called you to do, what are the consequences you experience? That's worth asking, isn't it? Second question, whose work is more important, yours or God's? Third question, what benefits do you experience when God's work becomes a priority? When you say God's work is now most important, what are the benefits that will accrue to your account as a result of that? Turn with me now to Haggai chapter 1, and let me read to you the chapter. Pay careful attention. Even in the reading of the text, there's so much that you can pick up on. Just follow along silently as I read aloud. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you, do not, you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages earns wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build a temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and the new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, 
and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Join me in prayer, please. Father, I love your word because it's timeless. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Instruct your people today. Help each one here to see that your word is alive and it is powerful. And it speaks to the 21st century as it did in the 5th century B.C. Minister to each heart, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Fascinating because in this book, we are actually given a date. Notice it says down in verse 1, in the second year of King Darius. Now, this is not King Darius of the book of Daniel. Uh, he was a Mede. This is King Darius Estapes. He ruled from 521 to 486 B.C. And notice it continues now. It's in the sixth month on the first day of the month. Let me be specific here. The date is August 29th, 520 B.C. The temple has now been left alone for 16 years. And how does God get his work done? It's the way he's always gotten his work done. He has his word spoken. And that's exactly what happens here because it says the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. Uh, just on the side, the name Haggai means my feast. Perhaps he was born on a feast day. Haggai first speaks to the leaders, and this is how it always works. Because you got to stir up the hearts of the leaders before you can move the hearts of the people. And continue with me here because in verse 2, thus speaks the Lord of hosts. And you might ask the question, who is the Lord of hosts? Who is this Yahweh Sabaoth, as it says in the Hebrew? It means Lord of armies. Lord of of armies. That expression is used 14 times in this two chaptered book. It's significant. The first time it appears in the Old Testament is in 1 Samuel chapter 1 in verse 3, but then there's an expression that is used by King David. Remember when the big guy Goliath comes after him? In 1 Samuel chapter 17, David acknowledges that Goliath has quite an arsenal. But then David says this, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. In other words, as David meets the guy who's nine feet, nine inches tall on the battlefield, he says, you come to me with weapons of warfare that are material. I come to you in the name, and the name represents the person. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts the Lord of armies. He commands the heavenly armies as well as the earthly armies. Have you ever been disowned by a parent, even temporarily? You ever been disowned by a parent, just even for a brief bit of time? I was uh, driving my friend's car and totaled it. The problem was I didn't have a driver's license. So when I came home and I had to tell my dad, uh, Lieutenant Burge, by the way, uh, what I had done, uh, his quote was to my mom, your son just wrecked his best friend's car. I was your son at that moment. Do you notice in verse 2, this people says, as the word of the Lord comes through Haggai, this People says, not my people, this people 
says. It shows God's displeasure with the nation of Israel. The time has not come. Hmm. It doesn't mean we won't do it. We're just not going to do it now. They are procrastinating what God would have them to do. Reminds me of the man who went to the psychiatrist, and he said, I got two issues. He said, I think I'm a Pepsi vending machine. The psychiatrist works with the man, does everything he can, and he gets exasperated. Finally, in desperation, he reaches into his pocket, pulls out four quarters, stuffs them down the man's throat, shakes his head, makes him swallow it, and he looks at the man in, in if you will, a moment of seeming victory and says, now, give me a Pepsi. The man said, well, that's my, my, my second issue. I'm out of order. The nation of Israel is out of order, and that is what stopped the work. And down in verse 4, a pertinent question is asked. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and the temple to lie in ruins? Notice the words, you yourselves. It's emphatic. God is calling out the nation. The nation has neglected their responsibility, and God says, hey, you're dwelling in the lap of luxury. You go home to these beautiful paneled houses, but think about the temple of God, how it lies in ruins. Then down in verse 5, the Lord of hosts then commands them with these words, consider your ways. The Hebrew actually says, set your heart on your ways. In other words, evaluate your paths. Stop and think about your life and the direction that you are taking. And can I ask you all to do that this morning? Can I ask you to take a good, hard look at your life, the direction that you are taking, and to see if you are pleasing to God? Are you more concerned with being in the lap of luxury than you are with God's work? And are you more concerned with the temporal and the physical than you are with the spiritual and eternal? Consider your ways. Point number one, and I'll give it to you right after I read verse six, and look at verse six with me. You have sown much, a lot of seed was spread out, and you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Whew. First point, ignoring God's work produces a frustrated existence. Ignoring God's work produces a frustrated existence. If you ignore the things of God, God can take the pleasure out of everything. You might have all the unsaved people running into clubs, running to parties, seemingly having a wonderful time, but God goes, "Uh uh-uh, you know you shouldn't be there in the first place. I'm not going to give you pleasure in anything. You're going to make money, and I'm going to blow it away. You're going to have clothing, but it's not going to keep you warm. Whatever you do, because I am not your priority, you will not be blessed. And when God takes the joy out of living, life isn't worth living. And that is what he says. Go to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy with me. That's your fifth book in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 28. See, the nation of Israel should have known this is what's coming. Because as they were taught the law, and by the way, the name Deuteronomy just means second law. It's not that there were a second set of Ten Commandments given, but rather the former generation that received the law had passed away, and now there was a new generation, so the law is being restated for them. And in Deuteronomy 28, we have the blessings and then the cursings. 
And let me just read to you to begin verse 15. This is Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and will overtake you. So they knew what was coming. Let me give you an example of some. Let your eyes come down to verse 38. 28, 38. You shall carry much seed out to the field and gather but little in, for the locust shall consume it. You shall plant vineyards and tend them, but you shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worms shall eat them. You shall have olive trees throughout all your territory, but you shall not anoint yourself with the oil, for your olives shall drop off. You shall beget sons, beget sons and daughters, but they shall not be yours, for they shall go into captivity. How's that? God says you're going to labor, but to no profit. I'm going to take away everything that you are laboring for. Because your priorities are wrong. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, but seek first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, keep me as a priority. I can give you the food. I can give you the clothing. I can take life and make it a joy for you, says the Lord Jesus Christ. But see, these folks were ignoring the things of the Lord. Some years ago, there was a story in the L.A. Times about a young man who um, went back to the home that he had grown up in. And he was reminiscing and uh, actually went up and he knocked on the door and a couple answered the door and he said, you know, I lived here 20 years ago. I was in a neighborhood. Can I come in and see the house? And they graciously consented and they let him go into the house. He's meandering around. He makes his way up to the attic and there he sees his old jacket. Puts his old jacket on, reaches into his pocket and there's a receipt. It was a receipt for a shoe repair shop. You see, it turns out that 20 years ago, when he was getting ready to move, he had put a pair of shoes in the shop to be repaired, and he forgot about it. So he goes all for kicks because the shoe repair shop was still there. He took the receipt, he went there, and he walks up to the clerk, and he says, may I get my shoes? The man goes to the repair portion of the shop. And he comes back out a minute later, and he says, they'll be done a week from Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the mind of the sluggard. They are always saying, a week from Thursday. And they keep putting things off. Let me illustrate for you from the smallest, or at least small, of insects. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 6, please. And as you're turning to Proverbs chapter 6, may I ask you, what have you put off? What is it that God wants you to do that you have just said, I'm going to get to it, I'm going to get to it? And the days have turned into weeks, and the weeks have turned into months, and the months have turned into years, and years, for some of you, maybe have turned into decades. What is it? How has the Lord put his finger on your life and said, for you, this is what I want. And you have just ignored it and you have procrastinated. My friend, you're playing with the grace of God. You're presuming that God is going to continue to permit you to live this way and to put off the things that are important to him. And I'm just saying to you, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. We're told to redeem the time because the days are evil. In essence, you and I are to make the most out of each and every day because we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Moses, who under his watch had seen over 2 million people buried, well, at least 600,000, because that was the amount of those that were 20 and above who were not permitted to go into the promised land. Think about all the funerals, if you will, Moses presided over. 
And how does he sum it up? He says, so teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart full of wisdom. That's Psalm 90 and verse 12. Some of us put off, put off, put off. And see, in the beginning, when God speaks to you, the voice is loud and it is clear. But then it's a little softer the second time. And maybe a little softer the third time. And maybe you're sitting there, if you will, under layers of fatness on your hearts. And now it's such a whisper you barely recognize when God is speaking to you. Ephesians talks about those who are past feeling it's a dangerous place to be. Procrastination, verse 6. This is Proverbs 6, 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. That's your assignment. Go check out the ants. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall your poverty come on you like a robber and your need like an armed man. Get out of bed. Stop being lazy. Learn how to be disciplined in life. See, the ant knows that the winter's coming. And if you don't gather up the food, why it is still time to gather food, you're going to starve to death. And God would say to you, learn from the ant. Stop procrastinating with your devotions. Stop procrastinating and putting off the eternal things for the temporal because I know your life is miserable. And I know you're having no pleasure in what you're doing. And you need to do an about face. You need to repent. And you need to change. Learn from the ant. And coming back to Haggai chapter 1. See, here's the remedy for those folks. In verse 8, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple. In other words, get done what you were told to do. Get it done. Stop procrastinating and see when they would, their obedience would bring God glory because the rest of the text says that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified. Look at verse 9. You looked for much, but instead it came to little. And when you brought it home, I, I blew it away. God can blow your money away. God can take away your resources. You really don't want to honor him first with your finances? God can take it all away. God can take it all away and it will give you no pleasure in what you keep that doesn't belong to you. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house? Can I ask you a very personal question? Are you idolaters? Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And you would say, how do I know if I'm an idolater? Is there anyone or anything that is sitting on your heart rather than the lordship of Jesus Christ? Anything. I like to say that idolatry can be like a proper noun. It can be a person, it can be a place, or it can be a thing. And our God doesn't want to have any rivals. He is Lord, and he wants you to acknowledge his lordship. It's that simple. That is who our God is. You know how 1 John ends? 1 John 5, 21. I know you're in 1 Timothy 6. I'm getting there. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Writing to a congregation saying, keep yourselves from idols. When it's time for you to have your devotion, where do you run? To whom do you run? Is it to your Facebook account? Is it to get on the phone and talk with somebody? What are you doing when you should be meeting with the Lord? What's taking the place of God? That might just be your idol. 
You know, we just came past Christmas. And Christians know, it's so explicit in the Bible, that on the first day of the week, we lay aside as God has prospered. In other words, when the offering plate comes around, as God has prospered us, we give. That's what God tells us to do. But instead of, you know, taking and giving to God, you took your money and you did what? Yourself, others. It's not hard to find your idol. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Not hard to find your idol, but we're told to get away from our idol because God will have no rivals. You read the Ten Commandments, and in Exodus 20, he's not going to have any gods before him. Whether you are sitting on the throne of your heart or someone else is sitting on the throne of your heart, whatever it might be, God says, no, no. You put me first in all things. In Colossians 1.18, it says this, that in all things, not some things, in all things, Christ should have the preeminence. As you work through your week schedule, does Christ have the preeminence when it comes to your devotion time? And when you start off the week, we're commanded not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You are in sin, my friend. You are in sin if you neglect the church of Jesus Christ because Christ died to build his church. I will build the church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. But you might go, oh, that's not a priority for me. Then your heart is not aligned with God's heart because God sent his son to die that the church of Jesus Christ should thrive. Who or what is sitting on the throne of your heart? God will have no rivals. Notice in 1 Timothy 6, down in verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. And my friend, by the standards of the world, most likely you are rich. Go around the world and see in half the world living off for less than $2 a day, you're rich. Go to some places and see how people are living or what we might call living, and you'll find out just how rich you are. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. I love the order. It all comes from God, and I, I enjoy what I have. You know, when I can have a steak, I enjoy my steak, right? When I enjoy time with my family, I can enjoy that time because it's all a gift from God. But if I ever take the steak and say, I'm going to buy food I can't afford, and I'm going to rob from God in the process, or if I ever take my family and say, here, you sit above God, that's sin. Jesus said that if you love father or mother, son or daughter, more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. He will have no rivals. Your mom and your dad, technically speaking, didn't create you. God did. He's the one who holds the universe together. He is the one who calls the shots. He is the one who is worthy of our adoration and our praise 24-7. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. We are to store up treasure in heaven by taking what God has entrusted to us and give it back to him. Coming back to Haggai. And notice now, down in verse 10. Boy, this is a bad day when this is said to you. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. In other words, from up above and down below, nothing is going to produce for you. God can shut you down. God can shut you down. And sometimes I pray that he will shut you down. Because your life is worthless if you're not living for the glory of God. Your life is not producing what God has designed you to be. If you're going about having an idol on your heart, you're not pleasing to God. And so what are you accomplishing of eternal value? Your life is a vapor. It's here one moment and it's gone the next. And let me tell you, what you do for Christ, that's what's going to last. In Deuteronomy 28, 23, and your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. 
we learn ignoring God's work produces a frustrated existence. The second th point, consider God's work superior to your own work. You need to say God's a priority in all things. Consider God's work superior to your work. And then here's number three, because this is where God wants to take you all. Obedience creates purposeful living with God's presence. I love that. Obedience creates purposeful living with God's presence. If you've got God's presence and you know why you're here, every day is good. And you wake up and you go, I know I'm here. I know what God has called me to do and I'm on it and I'm filled with joy. But for some of you, I pity you. Life is drudgery. Life is going through the motions. Life is trying to smile and pretend I'm happy when you're inside, you're going, I'm dying. And God sees it, and God has shut you down because some of you know better. You've been taught better. Train up a child the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. You might get away from the Lord for a bit, but you need to come back. And you need to turn around. And can I ask you an honest question? Do you want to produce in the next generation the way you lived? Do you want to hand down to the children what it is like to have all your children out of wedlock? Do you want to pass down to the next generation what it is like to spend more money than you make? Do you want to pass down to the next generation and on and on and on? See, because Paul says it this way, imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? We should want to give a holy handoff. We should want to be so close to God that this world means nothing to us and that those around us know we are consumed with our God and are being blessed by our God and our life is worth imitating and our life is worth following because everybody else out there, they are losers and they're just putting on the face pretending that they have a life when they're just going around in circles not having a clue about anything. That's the wisdom of this world. See, the leaders and the people, as it says in verse 12, and this is what's key, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. I'm not speaking to you today the philosophy of Ken Burge. I am telling you what God's word says. I am coming to you with the full authority of Scripture behind my message. The Thessalonians got it. Paul went and preached to them. And he said, when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it. It's as if they put out a welcome mat for the word of God. You welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. That's 1 Thessalonians 2.13. What happens when you get things right with God? The people feared the presence of the Lord. All due respect, and I said, it, I don't fear you. You might be able to kill my body, but that's all you can do. Jesus said, fear the one who can kill the body and then take the soul and put it in hell forever. I recognize that if I get out of line and God says, hey, that's enough, that he can send me from one end of the universe to the other end real quick. That's who we need to fear. We need to tremble at his word. When we're in his word and we're in his presence, we need to have a fear that our God could take our lives like he did with Nadab and Abihu back in Leviticus chapter 10 because they came into the Lord's presence drunk. Or when we are like Ananias and Sapphira, when we're wearing the facade, we're hypocrites. Oh, we gave so much money to the things of God. Is that what you gave? Yeah, that's what we gave. Ananias fell over first dead, and then Sapphira's wife. Don't you think that God can't do that today, my friends? Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. Isaiah 66, 2 says, but on this one I will look. It means I will look with favor. On him who is poor, that's the concept of Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who recognize they have nothing before God, that he has everything to give and we have nothing to offer. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles 
at my word. Remember when the law was given in Exodus and the people trembled. He said, hey, Moses, you don't meet with God. We'll just kind of hang out back here. Where's the fear of God? Do you want the presence of God in your life? I mean, do you really want the presence of God in your life. In verse 13, then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. Do you know what it's like when God's not with you? In Exodus chapter 32, Moses is up on the mount, he's getting the Ten Commandments, and the people below go, He's been gone a long time, we need a new God. Aaron, can you fashion this one? They took their gold earrings, gave it to Aaron. He got, a, he got a tool, and he fashioned a golden calf because that's who they worshiped back in Egypt, at least one of the gods. And he said, this is now your God that led you out of Egypt. What an insult to God. And you know the story. In Exodus 33, God says, hey, Moses, you lead the people, but I'm not going with you. That's verse 3. So what does Moses do? He prays to God, you don't go, I'm not going. <laughs> I'll tell you something, I don't want to go anywhere. I don't want to go anywhere where God's not with me. And on the other hand, I will go anywhere when God says, that's where I want you to be because that's where I'm at. And then as Moses prayed, God says, I will be with you. How awesome is that? I am with you. And then it closes out in verses 14 and 15. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel. Is your heart being stirred today? The son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Notice he's starting at the top. And the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. That's the, high, the highest level of the religious structure you go. And the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and they worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. There was a 23-day delay, delay from the time of the giving of the prophecy to the work. It was harvest time, so maybe that's what they were out doing, but they obeyed. We've learned three things. Let me rehearse these for you, and you'll be thinking about what you need to do. Ignoring God's work produces a frustrated existence. If you're frustrated, I mean really frustrated in life, it's time for you to repent. It's time for you to change your mind. It's time to say Christ first regardless of the cost. Doesn't matter who you have to walk away from. Doesn't really matter. You do whatever it takes to please Christ and he'll take care of you. Consider God's work superior to your own work. We're not that important. Your job just isn't that important. But when you work for God, that's important. And then finally, obedience creates purposeful living with God's presence. About 30 years ago, I went to a music store in Washington, D.C., and I bought my wife a piano 30 years ago. It was cherry wood. It was an Everett piano. It was beautiful at the time. It cost me over $2,000. That was a lot of money 30 years ago. I think I paid on that one for a while. My wife had used that piano to train our three sons by being homeschooled, and, and Josh was the one who really took the interest in piano. And uh, so about three years ago, we gave the piano to Joshua. So it's over his home in Lanham. Now, when my granddaughter has us over, she takes you by the finger and she leads you. You know, I do leadership training. I never have to give that girl a day of training. She just takes you by the finger and she just takes you where she wants you to go. That's it. That's where you go. And she'll take me over to the piano sometimes, which is hilarious if you know my musical background. And as I sit there and I put her on my knee, I'll play a little bit. And she'll play. And she touches the keys with such tenderness because she's watched her dad play all these years, our church pianist. But there's something that is just so classic that I love. Every time she plays, she has to reach up to the book and turn the page. Isn't that great? My friends, for some of you, it's time to turn the page. For some of you, 2015 wasn't where you should be, and you weren't doing what you should be doing. There are habits, practices in your life that you know is wrong. 
and you need to say, forgetting those things which are behind, I press forward. Some of you right now, there are some things you need to repent over. You need to change your mind and change your direction. You need to say, God, I've been my priority, or I have put someone else as a priority above you, or I have. You fill in the gap. God knows already. So would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes as, as we think about this first Sunday in a new year? As we consider how we want to live for the rest of this year, should the Lord...